The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. <coughs> Study to show yourselves approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Peter 1, 12. All right, let's take the customary time to uh, check ourselves, be sure we are where we need to be spiritually, i.e. in fellowship, and ready to concentrate on this unfolding development that Peter is presenting to us here. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you that you continue to provide for this local body, this environment, so that we can escape the corruption that is in the world and to pursue those things that you have promised to those who take you seriously. Bless our time together in Christ's name. Amen. All right. In these verses, I entitle this Peter's motivation for writing this letter. It's a, something personal about him that he relates to these believers. Therefore, inferential conjunction, or for this reason, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. I will always be ready. The word ready is a future active indicative looking down the road of the verb mellow, which means to be about to do something. Always is the adverb, A-E-I, always uh, to remind you, present infinitive, of the verb hupo mimnesco. It means to remind you concerning these things, information and that he has given up to this point. Even though, even though, subordinate conjunction, even though you already know them, already is supplied, that's fine. The perfect active indicator, even though you know, oida, and have been established, and have been established, this is the perfect passive participle, stay rizzo, means to establish, found also in James 5.8 and 1 Peter 5.10. You've already been established in the truth. In the truth, preposition in, of course, uh, <clears throat> you've already been established in aletheia, the truth, uh, to be established is the present participle of par aimi, uh, to be present in the truth and be established. All right, point one. Therefore is the inferential conjunction, D-I-O, meaning for this reason. It looks backward to verse 11 and the potential of a super abundant entrance into phase three from last time, or previous class. A super abundant entrance into the afterlife, phase three. Eternal kingdom of, God, of Jesus Christ is called there. Based on application of epinosis doctrine until uh, under the seven virtues of verses five through seven. Three, for Peter, the revelation of the future kingdom and glory is very special for those who persevere in the face of hostility and contradiction. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. So again, for the reason specified in verse 11, so again, for the reason specified in verse 11, Peter goes to special links to be sure that those under his charge are ready to meet the challenges to their phase two 
momentum. How is your spiritual momentum? The words, I will always be ready, show Peter's commitment to his calling to do what pastors and apostles and others did to study, teach, study, teach, keep pounding away at it. No let up. He took seriously Jesus' final wor words to him in, verse, in, James, in John 21. He said to him there, we call this section where he's dealing with Peter after the resurrection and after Peter's, after Peter's uh, prophesied denial of Christ in the face of a servant girl who just kept persisting that he was one of, their, of Jesus' followers. She knew him, even, even though it was at night uh, and the ambient light of the outdoor fireplace and all that, <clears throat> she, God used this young female servant. She might have been more than that. Uh, she might have been one of these types, I, I guess, that uh, has real good recollection of people that she's seen just based on one thing knowing faces and stuff. Because this is in the court area and everything. Anyway, that's just me. Uh, that she was that way and she just kept persisting. You're one of them. And so she, she hit him three times with it and he denied the Lord three times. After making this big boast that he'd die for him. After he had, when they came out to arrest him and Judas, Judas fulfilled the prophecy of one of his intimates betraying him. Came up and gave him the Judas kiss. So that the people coming out with their clubs like Jesus is some dangerous thing. <coughs> this, 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 this court mob. The authorities, not just dummies off the street. The, 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 this was the people in the court coming out there like they're dealing with this thing. I like, to re I like to revisit it because of what happened. Guess what Jesus did? He set every one of them down on their backsides. <laughs> Just <laughs> nobody got hurt other than their feelings. Don't you think that's time to go home? This doesn't happen. A person falls occasionally, but not the whole crowd. But they got up. That's, that's the stupid. And, and Judas comes up and kisses him there. And, and well, 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 before that, Peter goes macho. He pulls out a sword, a short weapon, and cuts an ear off of one of the people coming out. Just slices his ear off. See how maladjusted a believer who's been around Jesus all the time and, and heard everything you can, can be in a moment? Oh, you know, so Jesus had to fix the guy's ear back. You know, clean it up and, and put it back like nothing ever happened to it. Because, you know, if you got your ear cut off, blood would be everywhere. <laughs> it's all right, you're B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> I hear these people having these Bible studies. They don't bring this stuff out. So Peter denied him three times. Of course, he ran off. So this John 21 is basically is for the disciples that are there and it's kind of reassuring Peter that you're back and everything's okay. But he, but he puts him under some pressure. Not his revenge. Where he's asking him. Imagine asking Peter a question like that with these other apostles that were on that, in that particular occasion. Not all of them, but the ones that were there. He said, do you love me more than these? Back in the day, he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not now. He said, you know, I love you. He didn't say, yeah, I know I love you more than them. <laughs> He's got the starch taken out of him. Some of this, 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 this attitude that he had. Okay? So, in John 21, when he, when he would say this to him, he would add, you love me? Well, you got to prove it. If you love me, Feed my sheep. And then he talked about my little lambs. That's new, newbies, new believers. 
So this Peter heard in his youth, you know, right after Christ, of course, after his resurrection. And Peter went on and did it. <clears throat> Towards the end of his life, the Asian Christians, and when I say Asian, you know I don't mean Far East, the Asian Christians fell to his charge. He's in Rome, of course, I've told you that. Writing from there, Peter's responsibility to remind them of the things of verses five through seven ended with his promotion into phase three. This is at the very dead end of his apostolic ministry. <clears throat> These things, verse 12, refers to the virtues of verses five through seven and all those verses where the demonstrative pronoun hutas refers, it, it occurs in reference to the seven virtues. Have you been thinking about the seven virtues? You can pick one out of the list. You're here tonight. You're fulfilling one of them. If you're plugged in, knowledge. Look at all that stuff's in the Bible. We're supposed to know it. And it's a process. It, it, it should be, for anyone who makes a claim of positive volition, it ought to be a passion. The kind of passion that says, I'll walk away from anything that's interfering with it. <clears throat> I'll walk away from wealth, people, anything, geography, even if it costs me. This is the pattern to get in a local church where sound doctrine is taught. And since they're not in every city or all over the place, it turns out you're limited. Well, you've already, you are here ostensibly because you've made your commitment to your right pastor. And even if you fell by the wayside and came back, you came back. That's, that's good enough for me. That's, that's great. It's very encouraging. <clears throat> All right. Again, these things refer to the virtues of verses 5 through 7. Repetition, I'm going to point this out. Repetition is an essential part of communication in any discipline in life. Any discipline where you're trying to learn something. Repetition, repetition. If you're going to be good at it or be informed. So I have to repeat. I can't just teach something once. and that, It doesn't work that way. I got to keep, even if it's a basic doctrine, you've heard thousands and thousands of times in one form or another rebound. You got to keep hearing it. You got to keep being exposed to this because you can't get it out there. The cosmos and 99.9% and .9 of the Christians that I have run across or heard about, they don't even got that right. They might tell you you're supposed to confess your sins, but they don't give you the implications. When you're out of, they don't have, they can't put the STA into it, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the mechanic, it's the mechanic for the filling of the Spirit. When you're out of fellowship, you're grieving or quenching the Spirit, and a quick confession, you're boom, you're back. Boom. Over and over and over, and you need it every day. Just as a person who is concerned about their hygiene, keeps their hands, and other things clean. You don't want to live in a filthy environment. Even poor people know to clean up things around them. And there are rich people, there, you'd be shocked to walk into their house like a bunch of pigs. Because the way you take care of your personal possessions and your environment is a reflection of what you are. So if you had your house piled with junk and dirty, this isn't appropriate. So your person is the same way. And so these people out here are just flat nasty. They don't clean themselves up. We took a bath when we got saved because we got all of our past sins knocked out. An analogy. And when we rebound, 
you know, it's like, I'm cooking, I got stuff on my hands and I'm not gonna walk around and touch everything with it on my hands. I gotta run over at that sink repeatedly and rinse my hands and dry them off. Repetition is an essential part of communication in any discipline. You notice in the verse above, he says, I'll always be ready to remind you of these things. And I'll always be ready to remind you of the things you've heard over the years. I'm ready. And when you come to Bible class, one of the benefits is you are spiritually refreshed because out there, you're exposed to the cosmos. Even if it's just your work, you're exposed to uh, all that and your STA. And so you, you come here and be spiritually refreshed. Now, now, now if you failed in an area, don't, don't run around and beat yourself up. Mental flagellation. You know, those people, and you know, they have these holidays in Catholic countries like in Spain. They're walking down the street, whipping their backs with this. I've heard other ones too, it's even worse. Trying to, trying to atone for their own sins by, by torturing and harming their physical body. No place in the Word of God for anything close to that. So you have to walk, and I have to walk by faith. We've got to believe that when we confess our sins, we're, 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 re, we're, re, we're reset, so to speak. It may not last 10 minutes. The point is you're in fellowship and you're doing something. If you do it out of fellowship, as I was explaining to a believer one-on-one, -on -one, when you do the same thing that you're supposed to out of fellowship, that's human good. I'm gonna have a bunch of it at the Bema. I'm gonna start, a, a big fire is gonna happen around me. But, what I, but what's left is my reward package. And that's, that, 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 that will satisfy me. Repetition is especially important where the hearers are well informed, as in the case here. Hence the words, even though you already know them, you've got it down. You're, you're, you've graduated, so to speak. You, you, pa you, you have passed that phase and you know these things. I'm not telling you a bunch of stuff that's brand new. They, so, they, so we have to say that from the time that these Christians uh, Gentiles were evangelized, they've got some good teachers in there. And this is, this is time when people didn't have, they didn't have a written out New Testament. Think what a blessing it is to have a good translation like the New American Standard. I've looked at them. It is the best one, the 1995 one. They cleaned up the 1970 something one and got all the these and thous out. It was carryover from the King James. And got the right pronoun, the, the, kind, the kind we talk in. And the way you address God is, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, there's not some holy language for, you know, special language, uh, special pronouns when addressing God in prayer. You, and so forth. That was, that was just what they did back then. Peter is aware of the fact, point 13, that these believers have been well-versed in the doctrines related to the Christian way of life and other doctrines. This cannot be said of just anybody making a claim to faith in Christ. You can't say that about them. You have not been well-versed. I talk with believers and they, they, they run into other people and other, there are other denominations and groups. It's mind-boggling, the junk they believe mind-boggling, what they don't know. Because their pastors aren't doing their job. I got, I got invited today to a luncheon to honor pastors in the area. I don't think so. I fellowship with the like-minded, and they aren't. Can you imagine that? I, I, I just shudder thinking about it. I'd rather go in a strip club than to go there. I mean it. 
At least it, it's a straightforward, that all this false stuff and all these idiots hugging each other and carrying on. Ugh. I'm not, I'm not going to a strip club, so don't say that. <laughs> I went to one once as a fundy back in St. Louis. Me and some kids from the, young guys from the, the Baptist church, down on the strip in St. Louis. And the pastor's son was there. He, leads, he led the singing in the church on Sundays. I was embarrassed for him. This girl up there, you know, exposing herself and carrying on, and he's just screaming like a maniac, like, like somebody at a football game or something. I was embarrassed. But I didn't go tell his dad. He'd probably kill him. Hence the words, even though you know them. Okay, this can't be said of anybody. The reality of phase one and phase two truth resides in the souls of the readers as a result of an extended period of indoctrination under faithful shepherds. First Peter, first Peter 5.10, you remember? Back then we saw that Peter, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, I, I, that's the wrong verse. Oh, I got here. Sorry, I didn't catch that. First uh, Peter chapter five. It's not verse ten. It's verse one. Cross out the zero. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising you know, uh, oversight. And he tells them. The, the do's and the don'ts, not under compulsion, voluntary, according to the will of God, not for money, but for eagerness. Don't lord it over people because you've got authority. Those allotted to your charge. So at Maranatha Church, those attend here and recognize me as their pastor, you're allotted to my charge. Just like a shepherd would have X number of sheep to go out to pasture. Those are allotted to his charge. And you did that of your own free will. I'm just sitting here, whoever comes and sits and takes it seriously. That's something that is not recognized today. With other people filling pulpits, bouncing all around. Those allotted to your charge. And this goes back to John 10. You hear your shepherd's voice. As with the, the woolies out there, they knew the voice of their shepherd who took them out daily and watched over them and led them into pastures so they could eat and get fat and grow up and all that. People have told me, I've listened to other pastor teachers because we're on vacation and went to the church, but I recognized that you know, while he was doing his job, he wasn't, he wasn't my right pastor. It's not that difficult. It's not natural for somebody to be listening to all these different people out here, even if they were teaching the truth and they're not. If they're listening to all these people online and all these other ministries, a lot of do your charge. I have, to, I have to remind people of that from time to time because you'll be attacked for it. That's one of the, one, one of the reasons they, they, they would like to call me a cult because I said that when you get with your pastor teacher, you stick with him. We got seven churches of Asia the book of Revelation. And they're put in this prophetic book to illustrate seven eras of the church age and the characteristics and conditions of those eras. Some are easier to pinpoint than others, but they're all sequential from the Ephesian church, which was the apostolic era towards the end of it, and then Smyrna, which was the period of state-sponsored, Roman-sponsored persecution, ten, 10 persecutions. And then we go down through all of them and come down to the last one, they got no commendation. The church, it was wealthy. The, the, the general congregation were very well-to-do. There's nothing wrong with that. They were very well-to-do, but they were lukewarm. And he told them, you're poor. So somewhere, they watered everything down. The, and, and each of those churches had a pastor represented by uh, the, the, 
the seven stars in the opening of it, the vision of John of the seven stars on sticks, seven, so representing the heads of each of those churches, the designated pastors. All those churches started off right on the right foot, but different things happen. So you have a combination of condemnation, commendation, or all condemnation or all commendation. Only two got all commendation. Only two got all condemnation. And this was written, this was written so they could, where they needed to, get their corporate act together. Or else. I will, and one threat was, or I'll remove your lampstand. It'll be it. So we'll have to see if they took, if, if, if they took, uh, we, we meet these people in phase three, if they took this to heart and stuck with it. Obviously those churches are all long gone. Uh, some of those towns don't even exist other than archeological sites. Anyway, they had an extended period of indoctrination. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, an extended period of indoctrination. Yeah, okay, never mind. <clears throat> Hence, the perfect passive participle have been established. The verb sterizo means to make solid, and therefore, by implication, immovable. It is used in connection with rigorous teaching of Bible doctrine. The Thessalonian church in northern Greece, Alexander's area, Thessalonica. Uh, this uh, Paul was away from them and, 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 and wanted to know how they were doing. And we set Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Strengthen you, encourage you. As you listen to doctrine and live your Christian life, you get stronger and stronger in the soul. They were firmly established, settled in their understanding of the plan of God. Interestingly, the word occurs in Luke 22, 31 and 32, where Jesus prophesied with respect to Peter after he was squared away that he would turn, he would in turn strengthen the brethren. 21, these words were in, these words were in connection with Peter's impending denial of Christ. Peter's fall was the direct result of not being diligent and taking seriously, and that was true of all the rest of them too. Their fall, uh, it wasn't fatal, but it was a fall, a defection momentarily, in the intake of Bible doctrine. They, they did, it's like some people, they don't want to hear about the flat earth, or they don't want to hear about whatever it is. So they, they, they try to work their way around it. See. They, they were raised up Jews in unbelief that the Messiah would come and deliver us from all of our enemies and make Israel great and salvation was by the law and all this stuff. But they came and they recognized to their credit, each one of them except Judas, they recognized that he was the Messiah. They embraced that idea. No, they didn't have all their ducks in a row. And they and people like Peter did not want to hear about Jesus' sufferings, crucifixion. You think, well, the, the upbeat part of it, he's going, to be raised, he's going to be raised from the dead and ascended and all that. I didn't, see, they were, they, had, they, were, they were clinging to this idea in their heads that in any minute now, Jesus is going to deliver Israel and make this wonderful kingdom and blah, blah, blah. They were getting the crown before the cross. He had to go through what he had to go through so he could even save anybody. Sin had to be paid for. 
And that meant that he had to walk this thing alone. And the disciples all folded because they were not diligent in the intake of the, of the doctrine. Only after he took the whole truth seriously could he really strengthen positive volition. The final words of the verse are, which is present with you. This expression, along with the references to doctrine in 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 2.2, 2, points to the notion that there was and is a clearly defined and authoritative body of truth that is being communicated throughout the world. Even though it may be few and far between, that doesn't matter. We know that this body of truth, in the little shortest letter, well, maybe, maybe Philemon's shorter, I didn't count the words. Uh, what we have here, uh, the, the, the author of this, Jude, Beloved, while I was making every reference to write about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So we got the body of truth. There's no, there's no, no other information out there that we have to concern ourselves with. These believers needed to have a firm grasp on the issues pertaining to the Christian way of life as they would face the onslaught of many false teachers in the years to follow. This is a different type of attack. There's the attack of traditional persecution by unbelievers, and then there's the attack of the rise of false teachers. Well, I'm here to protect you from false teachers. Now, I can't protect you when you're out there. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're surfing online with all these dummies, like well, I know one person in particular, they thought they were above what you, the rest of us. They can go look at stuff. And that started undermining their thinking with regard to doctrines like the blood of Christ taught here and some others and who the Antichrist is. I don't know who the Antichrist is to my face. I sure do. And it isn't Nimrod. <laughs> it isn't Nimrod. He... Okay, I'll, I'll give it. He's, he's a type, possibly, of the Antichrist. There's one other, one other uh, person that was a type of the Antichrist, and he was a Greek, Antiochus Epiphanes. So you're out there looking at this and think you're above being drugged down by it? Why aren't you happy with what you've got here? It'll do everything you need. It'll get you the crown. It'll get you, give you, and, and you'll be continually be getting answers if you're here and paying attention. And when you have to miss, we'll have, it'll be on our webpage pretty quick. I had a couple people tell me, I got, I got the class 20 minutes after you stopped, Jack. I said, well, good, I hear that. They, they were just listening to the audio on the deal. Uh, YouTube, it, it, could take, it could take from an hour to a whole day, because it's slow, heavy traffic. But getting it on our webpage, the audio part and all that, real quick. Do what you have to do. That's what I tell people. Do what you have to do. Do. If something happens uh, and you have to miss, but uh, don't use excuses. Don't use excuses. And certainly not for other things like, well, I have a chance to go do this and I've always wanted to in town. Skip it. Skip it. It wasn't meant to be. That's all I can say. This was my priority, and ever since I got on doctrine, to be in that church down there in Houston for seven Bible classes a week, Saturdays off, two on Sunday. I mean, if he went off on a, on a, on a conference uh, with tapers out wherever, then I just stayed home. I didn't go listen to his assistant pastor because I, I considered it a violation, but I didn't make a big issue of it. I just stayed home. And when he got back in town, and was up in that pulpit, I was there. I only, only defected one time uh, trying to make extra money and took this job uh, with a security company, sitting out in my car at night, watching some rich guy's house with a, with a 45 on my hip. And I felt guilty, and I should have. I, I got away from that. 
So that was, that was, that was to just make some more money instead of, instead of being content with things as they were. But God taught me that by my own miscue back, back in the 70s. <clears throat> the antidote to this growing threat is soundness in the faith and sticking with it and not giving these people the time of day. Well, you need to come do this. I was talking to somebody today about how worthless these in-house Bible studies are that they have, they offshoot things from their churches and they get together so they can have refreshments and food and all this. And, and, and so you get all these people sitting around giving their opinion. Oh, I, I said, this, this person had gone to these over the years before here and all. And I said, just, just politely tell them, no, thank you. And if you want to, tell them I found the right kind of church. And I'm not there yet, but I'm heading there. And it's in Oklahoma City. This is up in Miami, or however you pronounce it. It's spelled like Miami. Anyway. So they went, they went all over that time. There's nothing up there that, that even compares to Sound Doctrine. Nothing. I said, so don't go to these stupid get-togethers where people are all throwing out their own ideas. It's like the worst food you could ever eat. It's going to make you sick. It's not going to get you anywhere. I want an expert teaching me the Bible. I want someone that has the gift. I want someone that has had the academic training and so forth. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want these people. I don't want some bombastic preacher playing with people's emotions. They don't do verse by verse. No, they may cover a few verses, but don't. This antidote is the growing threat is soundness in the faith. And verses 13 and 14, we have Peter's, we have Peter's urgency. Uh, because at this time, Peter was very close to fulfilling that prophetic statement that Jesus made about him back there when, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, where Peter is being restored and, and, and told by Christ after the resurrection there uh, to, feed his, to feed his sheep. And it, it was at that, and of course, he's a young guy. He's, you know, he's probably not quite 30 and that's when, when the Lord informed him what would happen at the end of his life. And he carried that with him his whole life, that he would be a martyr. That, his life, that he would seal his faith and his life with martyrdom. And, Pe and of course, Peter is at this age, he's in Rome, all the rest of it. That's where both he and Paul were martyred, pretty close to the same time. Uh, for those of you uh, off, off, okay, we'll, we'll pick this up. But don't, well, I'm not I haven't, I haven't said a prayer yet, so we're not out of here quite yet. Did you hear that among the Hezbollah, Hezbollah terrorists of, up in the north in Lebanon that their pagers caught on fire and the last figure I had it killed 14 people. It severed fingers, cut holes in people. They're pagers. Somebody put some kind of malware in it. I wonder who that could have been. Huh. These are, this is what the terrorists talk to each other on, these pagers. They caught on fire. Got hot as hot can, you know. It's in the news, it's all, it's around. It's not so much of the physical damage that is done, it's psychological. This is what we can do. The Jews have more things up their sleeve too. That's one thing I wanted to tell you if you hadn't read that in the news, some of you have. 
Also, there is three things that are going to happen in the astronomical things all together on the same day. One is a red moon. They're not that uncommon. But there's a meteor and there's some other things all going to happen on October the 2nd, the Feast of Trumpets. Call it a coincidence. I just told you that it's out there. It's going to happen on that date. I, uh, Lenny sent it over to me, and I sent it to a couple people to read it. It's, and it's from a Christian's perspective, too. Because, so that's the second person outside the church I've ran across, and there could be a lot of others, I don't know, that the rapture's got to occur. But whatever year it is, it's got to occur. On the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, which translated in the Hebrew means top of the year or Feast of Trumpets. That will end the church age. Pentecost started it. God always keeps everything neat and in order. And there's a verse in the Old Testament that God doesn't do anything unless, he's, unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Think of all the events that occurred in history people knew ahead of time when this was going to happen, how long they were going to be, between, and so forth. The exodus in Egypt, the years, it's in there. <laughs> Abraham knew it. Everyone else could have known it. And other such things. Daniel's 70 weeks of years, the timing for the first advent in the 64th week of years. On and on it goes. Of course, when the rapture occurs, everybody knows, but everybody can know that there is 2,500 and 20 days until the second advent. Just mark it on your calendar. 20 and 1260 for the first and 1260 for the second half. Or seven, or seven years, Daniel's week of years. Okay? That's, that's pretty clear. So God reveals it. One of the verses that they, people like to quote often is, no man knows the day or the hour. They like to just knee-jerk that one all the time. I don't think they've gone in there and analyzed everything he said. And was he talking about the second advent or the rapture? Nobody knew anything about the rapture then. Of course he would have, but nobody knew about that. Everybody knows that when the rapture occurs, we've got... 2,520 days until the second advent. And then there's a time frame of days in between that before the millennium officially starts. You will get that at the end of the book of Daniel. God lays down in his word a road map. So people aren't caught off guard. So, so I, I, I've been working on that. And the, the, the hang up, I, one of the hang ups I was having was they don't have the temple yet. But I, made it, but, but, but I made a clarification. It came to me stronger than I'd had it before. The Antichrist isn't going to hit the ground and be screaming, kill all the Jews and wipe out the nation of Israel. No. He's going to be their fake friend and Savior and Messiah. But he can't just start off. So he's going to make it possible, in my opinion, this will be my opinion, He's going to make it possible for the Jews to freely put that temple up. But he is going to take down enemies around Israel. He's going to overrun nations in a horror wind. None of these quagmire battles, you know, like in Ukraine. He's going to take them out. He's going to take them down fast and hard. It's going to be mind spinning what he can accomplish. In the, in the first, in those, well, well, we'll go to the first three and a half years. But once, and the whole world is fired up about taking down the Jews, he's going to conquer the whole world. He's got enemies besides God. But he's, but he's going to take down that Muslim stuff. He's going to wrap it up and, and do it in. You can count on it. 
And this is going to clear the, clear the decks for the Jews to do this thing. And of course, all this other stuff's going on uh, where the two prophets are in the, we'll get to that. The two prophets will be in the Middle East. Moses and Elijah reappear. Have a second run at it in their natural bodies. And they will call Israel back to God. Just like John the Baptist did. Same environment, same out there, and nobody can touch them for three and a half years. And there's other things to be added to this for this dynamic of Alexander. I can see where a negative person, an unbelieving type person, will just fall all over themselves with regard to this guy. He's going to break the mold. He's going to be like these politicians we got out here today. He's going to do it his way. He's going to be politically incorrect. He's going to be against every religion. But he's going to play it, play it different with the Jews. And that's why the Christians, the believing Jews, are told when that AI that looks exactly like him is set up in the most holy place of the rebuilt temple to get out and go to these specified places and you're going to hang out there for three and a half years if, you, if you're in the will of God. You flee to these places and like Edom, a tourist, a tourist thing now, go look up online, Edom. It's the Hebrew word for red because the rock's all red and they carved it out of this mountain. It's, it's phenomenal. That's one thing I missed when I was in Israel. But anyway, that, that uh, just say I was there, you know, but uh, I didn't go. <clears throat> anyway, uh, they're going to hide in there in another place. And God's going to put a protective shield over it. They can't throw a missile in there. They're going to send some armies to try to get them. And the earth will split and suck them all in. I don't think we're going to do that again. So that's, that's my, my considerations uh, with regard to the tribulation. I'm a, I'm a believer that's, that grows in grace and, and insight too. You don't get all this all at once. And I always pray, you know, keep, because you told me to in your word, if any man lacks wisdom and you know what I lack, get it to me so I can distribute it to positive volition. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name.